everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with the very well-organized and very (laughs) well-prepared Nikki Kinzer. We'll see. (laughs) I don't know. We've never done this before, so I don't... Is this a Pandora's box a little bit? (laughs) Did you notice (laughs) that when, like, as the questions started flooding in? (laughs) That's right. Well, I, you know, it's fun to see the questions. I love seeing the questions, and I appreciate everybody uh, bringing bringing them to our attention and and taking the time because oh, totally. there was definitely um, a lot of backstories to these questions and so which was really helpful to kind of understand where people are coming from and um, it was great it, it's just it's it's uh, you do need to have some organizational skills on you know putting <laughs> putting the questions into categories and trying to figure out how to relay the information to people in the best way so yes yeah. well and so what this is what we're doing today we're it, it, this is our big Q&A episode and we just it, it was so much fun preparing for to, to respond to these questions and give some of these ideas. So that's what we're going to do today. It's the big Q&A episode. We have a ton of questions, and we're just going to bust through them as quickly and yet thoroughly, uh, but efficiently, as yet we can. non-distractedly <laughs> as we can. Uh, I think we're going to start with some organizing que- the organizing questions that you've got. We've got some questions on uh, students and technology and productivity at work and information. It's just a lot of great stuff. Uh, before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Uh, join us on Twitter. Twitter and Facebook. Subscribe to the show anywhere the finest podcasts are served. We sure appreciate hearing from you. And you can always leave us a voicemail at 503-664-4ADD. Though even with this big Q&A episode, I don't think anybody called, did they? No. No, it's really the email and, and Twitter and Facebook. Those were the best places to reach us. Well, anyway. and and aren't you going to do like a kind of a chapters thing on the show notes? Yes, that is a, a new thing that we'll do on this episode. I will include chapter markers in this show. So if you're using, um, you know, I think Overcast and Pocket Cast, all the major podcast apps on mobile support chapters so that you can actually see kind of the, what the questions are and jump right to the question that you want answered. So, um, you know, I'll do my best to make that clear in the in the chapter markers. Um, so that Which you is can a great idea. Yeah. yeah, great yeah, idea. For shows it's, like this, it really yeah. is. It's really easy. So, all right, um, let's get started. <laughs> okay, let's do this thing. Uh, All right. Why don't you go first? Okay, so I have um, three sort of kind of general. Actually, I have more than three. So I have a few uh, organizing um, questions. So the first one comes from Meg, and she asks, I've heard you mention a strategy of having a body double while you're working on organizing. Could you please tell me how the strategy works or what a body double is? So, um, What a body double is, it's basically a person that is in the room with you while you're working on an organizing project. And this person could be helping you um, with putting things away or, you know, putting the things that you're going to be donating into the donation box, whatever. Uh, But they don't actually have to be helping you if, if they don't want to or you don't want them to. They could just be simply like reading a book or doing their own thing. Um, so the whole purpose of a body double is to have the presence of the person in the room with you. It anchors you um, and keeps you focused and, and keeps you on task. So if they notice that you're starting to drift away from your project, they can kind of steer you back. Um, and it's also a visual reminder for you because you see them that, okay, this is what I'm, this is what I'm working on and this is what I need to stay focused on. And uh, it just moves the process along. I like there that. There you go. Let's That's a check. body double. We've got one okay. off the list. All right. So from Martha, I have, I get that everything needs a home idea, but how do you decide how and where to even house things? Mm. Right? Yeah. I know. So this is a great question. Uh, they're all great questions. I <laughs> I'm probably going to say that over and over again. What a great (laughs) question. question. Yeah. Uh, But this can definitely be a roadblock for many people when it comes to organizing because we we get stuck on thinking that there's a right or wrong way to do things. um, And there just isn't. So what I would say is that you have to house things where they make the most sense to you. Where are you going to find them? Um, Remembering that out of sight is usually out of mind. So you want to look at your most important items and that's space and make sure that those are placed in the most obvious areas Mm -hmm. so that you can find them later. Um, And the other thing to always keep in mind is that you can always tweak your placement of things. So if something doesn't work, you can always, you know, come back and change it. But what we want to avoid is not making a decision at all. 
So that's when items become clutter. So definitely make a decision. Just don't worry about if it's the right one or not, because you can always change it later. That's good. I think we we often get cemented in the fact that uh, I'm going to change something. It better work. And and the the truth is that's a false assumption. It might not work. And in some cases, it's better if it doesn't because you learn something. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Now, kind of on the same theme here for Mallory, um, one of my biggest challenges with organizing, and I think this is the ADHD in me, is that I tend to wait until I have enough time to do it right. I would love to hear about techniques to overcome this as I rarely find hours at a time to tackle these projects. So the first thing that I want to respond to is that I actually do not want you to find hours at a time (laughs) to tackle your projects. Um, If you wait for hours, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Um, What I would rather you be looking for is just minutes. Just look for a few minutes here and there, because what we want to do is we want to start small and we want to get started. So as you're start, because you're starting small and you're only doing it in small chunks of time, you're going to start seeing progress. And that becomes um, a good thing because then that's momentum. You want to keep going. And it's a lot less overwhelming when you're only working on a project for 15 minutes rather than thinking that you have to do it for four hours. Absolutely. Now, the other point that I want to make around her question is around doing it right, which is kind of going back to the question that I just answered. There is no right way to organize. Um, There is no such thing as perfection. And if you think that there is, that will sabotage your efforts. So, and it's going to keep you stuck. And and then again, that avoidance is going to come into play. So what we want to do is allow yourself to work on these projects without placing any kind of judgment if you're doing it right or wrong. Don't worry about the outcome. You can always change it later. There are competing themes, and it's one that I'm going to talk about, too. There is, at the same time, you don't want to invest too much in uh, in thinking that it has to be perfect the first time. At the same time, it's a delusion uh, if you think that you don't have time to plan. Uh, and so, you've, you've like, both of those things can operate in the same space, and we'll talk more about that as more questions come down. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions coming from Bobby. Uh, one question is I have ADHD as well as both of my sons. Nothing seems consistent in my family. How do I set up routines and systems that endure in the long term? Mm. Okay, so the first um, response that I have is that we have to set realistic expectations. Um, new routines and systems are going to take time um, before they're ever going to become habits. And so there's a lot of structures that need to be put into place for you to actually get these things into habits, right? And we've talked about this in the past of how to use reminders, accountability partners can help, the commitment, the follow through. Um, we've also talked about maybe putting some rewards, you know, around the habits to keep everybody motivated. Um, all of these things can definitely help you. So but, you know, the first thing I think is just setting the real the realistic expectation that it's going to take some time. Um, the other expectation that I want people to, to really um, take in is that routines are not going to be 100% consistent. They're just not. Um, so, you know, it would be great if things happened on a daily basis, but even if the routine only works 50% of the time, that is better than doing nothing. And again, we're not looking for perfection here. We're only looking for for something better than what it was. So I don't want people to just jump to the conclusion that the routine isn't working because you're not consistent. Because the consistency has nothing to do with it. This is the the uh, home decor magazine conundrum, right? That, that right. in the same way that we think that organized means clean and beautiful, like a uh, you know parade of homes house. So do we also believe that a routine has to be perfect and uh, you know completely idiot proof every time? Yeah. And you just can't give up on it because right. if, if there's something about it that works, then that's what you have to go back to and not, again, take that judgment away of whatever reason you, you know, who cares why you didn't do it, but if it works, do it today. That's right. So that, that's um, what I want to talk about with that. The other question um, that she had isn't necessarily with organizing. Um, it's more about hyper-focusing on, on hi- hobbies and how do you nurture myself without taking it too far into hyper-focus and escape. So I'm just going to briefly talk about that a little bit because this is a hyper-focus kind of question. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and when I first read this question, I thought about you and I, um, our conversation, Pete, about gating time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that there's something around setting boundaries here around um, when do you focus on your hop- hobbies? And if you know that it's a hyper-focus concern, you know, what do you kind of need to do to plan for it? Um, and that might be setting alarms that might be having actually somebody call you and interrupt you in the middle of the hobby, um, doing whatever you need to do to make sure that you don't go down that rabbit hole. That's the, it's, it's a catch 22. Uh, and, and I think that's the root of, of this problem, this question, right? Because when you go, when you find you're in escape mode, you're in the really negative, uh, you know, kind of hyper focus and it is impossible without great training and great focus right it's Mm -hmm. impossible to stop yourself automatically that's the challenge like it's a catch-22 that you 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 have to say stop and check in with myself i've got to stop and check in with myself but you're hyper focusing so you can't stop and check in with yourself right right it's really hard to do well and that's exactly why you need to have the outside structure coming in and interrupting you absolutely that is the value of intermittent alarms Uh, and and another reason i love pomodoro because the you know in, in this case pomodoro is a micro focus system which allows you to set these alarms for 25 minutes right and 25 minutes is something where you know, you may get into that, into the zone, into the flow of hyper focus, but in 25 minutes, you know, you can count on the fact that you're going to get a little beep that will remind you to stop and check in with yourself. Am I still being fueled by, uh, you know, in a good way by this hobby? Am I still being, uh, am I still preparing my mind to work on something that is, you know, product- productive after I work on my hobby? Those mm-hmm. kinds of questions that you can do, uh, you know, with the external support. Okay, so this is a question um, that was really tricky for me to answer, and I'm going to answer it in all of my honesty (laughs) that I possibly can. (laughs) Um, Okay, so here we go. I spend all of my day at home while the rest of my family is out at work or school. Thus, the state of the living space affects me more than anyone else in the family. Consequently, organizing our home is important to me and not so to the rest of the family. Once they leave, I'm left with their mess and I resent that. It seems like when everyone is home, all I'm saying is put this away, put that away. Oh, that's such a good question. Yeah. How do I get others to take responsibility for something they don't have much stake in? And this is where it gets tricky because on the show last week, I gave my suggestions on how to get the family involved. Um, Now, assuming that you've listened to that show and you feel like those strategies still don't work for you, then it really becomes a different issue altogether. And what I mean by that is it really becomes more about the relationships at home and it's not about the strategies. And the two relationships that I'm talking about here are the parents and the children. And then you've got the two parents who are married, right? So the parents have to decide how they want to handle the situation because it becomes more of a parenting. How are you going to parent your children? And, you know, what are the rules of the house? What happens when they're broken? What are the consequences? And what's the follow through on that? And that's a parenting decision that that you have to make. And, you know, and then the same thing with the spouse. If you have a spouse who's not invested and they don't care as much as you do, that's a, that's a tough situation. And especially if there's resentment that's starting to build up around that. So this is my advice. At that point, depending on how bad the situation is and what other things could be going on, I suggest that it, it may be time to actually find a family therapist to help the family come up with solutions that do work for them and trying to get everyone on the same page and working together. And that is really the line between coaching and therapy that I, that when I read that, that's, does that make sense why this was tricky to answer? Yeah, it does make sense. And and there's something, I mean, what, the way she framed it, that, that, you know, it's not something that they have stake in. There is something they do have stake in, and that is their relationship with you, right? I mean, that's, right. it's not just the space anymore. It's about how you feel in the home. And, and I think that's the message that needs to be communicated. It's not just put this away, put that away. It's, you know, you guys don't have to live here as much as I do. And make that clear mm-hmm. um, that, that it's, 
it's not a problem of clutter. It's a problem of, of sort of mutual respect in the relationship. And I think about my own family. I know my kids are not here all day. And yeah, and I am. And so uh, since I work out of the house, I, I feel like I have a very similar kind of um, situation. And so uh, for me to say, would you please put your shoes on the shoe rack? It's not about keeping the hallway clear. It's about respecting the relationship for me. I will continue to feed them and, you know, do their laundry uh, and, you know, those sorts of things if they will respect me, not just the space. Right, right. And if that is still becoming an issue, and that's where I'm saying that... Then you need support. Yeah, you you need, need support. to help right. mediate yeah. that conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was a great question. Yeah. And, and, and it was tough for me to answer. I, I had to really sit and think about that one because I didn't want to just, you know, say, Oh, well, here's another strategy because I think it goes deeper than that. And, and that's right. where my honesty comes in is that yeah. I just, I think it may be deeper and that's where you need to, um, like you said, it, it's, it's about those relationships. So totally agree. All right. Moving on. So we've got some great ones here for you, Pete, um, as well to answer. There's a product or a, a question about productivity and yeah. also about information clutter. Where do you want to go? Oh, these are so juicy. Uh, I would love to start with the productivity at work question. Awesome. Uh, this one, I, it, you know, this one is, it was interesting. This is from Tracy says that uh, she was diagnosed uh, at, with ADHD at the age of 47. Uh, she has tried many of these uh, strategies to help her function with ADHD lists and iPhone apps and alarms and, and all of these things to organize her personal life. But at work, she's an account manager. She works with many clients and she deals with a lot of emails and short-term problems, all these things that need to be resolved as well as large projects that involve many weeks and multiple steps, and she can't juggle it all. She says she's having a hard time staying on top of the new emails and demands that pile up every day and can't set aside time for long-term projects. She says, and I'm going to talk about each of these, that she's heard of Kanban and Pomodoro and GTD, but she hasn't been able to put anything in place that works consistently. She is really struggling and finds she has to work 50 hours a week to stay afloat. Help. So... (laughs) Explanation mark, explanation mark. Multiple (laughs) explanation marks, yes. So, you know, first and foremost, beware the allure of new systems, right? First, got to stop and and address the source of the problem. Now, I'm making some assumptions here, but by all the exclamation marks, it really sounds like we have a capacity problem. Mm -hmm. And so since you mentioned Kanban, Tracy, uh, Kanban was originally a a manufacturing methodology, right? It uses boards and cards, and it it was defined really by Toyota and, and helped them in the 1940s. 40s and 50s to scale to just-in-time manufacturing through precision inventory and supply chain control, right? It's a really big deal in the project management world, uh, but there is this core principle in Kanban that is super appropriate here. Establish an upper limit to work-in-progress inventory so you don't overload the manufacturing system. All right. One more time. Establish an upper limit to work in progress inventory so you don't overload the manufacturing system. Okay. Pete, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> what does that mean? I know it sounds very uh, supply chain management jargony, but listen, you are the manufacturing system. You are overloaded, and this Kanban mentality can help you see how overloaded you are, and it might just guide you to step back to highlight pain points that you have too many uh, inboxes, too many things coming in that you can go and, and, and approach your account director and say, "Hey." I need help. I am I am stressed. It is causing me to work less efficiently. I need we need another human resource in this in this position because I need to scale back some of my responsibilities in order to do the rest of it right, right? That's really what we're talking about is taking this giant sort of uh project management now methodology and applying it to a personal workflow. Things come into your life, you process them, you take put them out of your life, right? They go out the door. Now, what if that's not possible? What if that boss says, sorry, you're going to have to figure it out? Yeah. We can't hire another person. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes that's, that, that's just going to happen. And you know, you're going to have to start making some decisions about what you, what you focus on. I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, Tracy, you mentioned Pomodoro. Again, I, I mentioned that this is time management. It's all about sort of focus and these little alarms that help you work in smaller doses. That's not really going to solve your problem. GTD is generally an all in system. I, I typically find people who don't really adopt 100% of the methodology, uh-huh. uh, you know, yeah. they break it if they try to go 
halfway. Um, and so, you know, I, I think Kanban may actually be a really good approach to you. And there's a book I would recommend called Personal Kanban, Mapping Work, Navigating Life by Jim Benson and Tony Ann DeMaria Berry, uh, link in the show notes. Uh, and I, I really like the idea that they, they do a good job of, es- of establishing what the methodology is mm-hmm. and then scaling it down to personal work, right? So all of this said, think of yourself like a method, uh, like a manufacturing system, develop your work inventory control management. How much can you handle at once and, and figure out where your inputs and outputs are? Uh, you might consider a tool like Trello. Uh, it offers the ability to define and then work according to this Kanban mentality. It's free for individuals. Uh, there's a small monthly fee if you start adding team members. My experience is that, you know, we don't work in a vacuum in an account management, uh, you know, uh, context, right? We work with team members. There are many people who are contributing to the work that we do. So consider, um, you know, there's, there is never a, a better way to get yourself focused on a system than having other people force you to work on that system by joining you in it. Oh, right. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. You, you, whatever tool you use, uh, that's that's really the quickest way to get your house in order is to have uh, that social accountability. You know, did did you check uh, this? Did you check Trello? I put the updates in Trello. OK, well, now am I, I'm I'm habituating to this new tool. So um, I would think about that. You, you definitely it sounds like have a frustrating capacity problem. I absolutely mm-hmm. resonate with that. Um, and uh, I, I would be I would be looking for ways to creatively um, delegate. Uh, both up De- and yes. down. Well, and the other thing I just want to quickly add is I had a client recently that that dealt with something very similar to this. And one of the things that we kind of came up with as a solution was to to go to her supervisor and ask them if they would help her figure out what the priorities are. Like, so, you know, maybe we can't add, you know, a person or an assistant, but with, with what I have in front of me and you're looking at it and I'm looking at it, can you help me kind of figure out what are the top priorities this week? What has to get done? And that can kind of help kind of filter things out too. Cause I know that sometimes we think everything is important and that may not be the case. So just having another set of eyes, especially a supervisor set of eyes can be very helpful to just make sure you're, you know, you're working on the right stuff. Yeah, I, you know, it's in, in an account management capacity. Generally, there are, there is a mix of uh, deliverables, and you know, some of them have hard dates associated with them. Some of them mm-hmm. have soft dates associated with them, and some of them have no dates associated with them. And once you you take a step back and think, what are the things that have hard dates associated with them? Focus on those first. Uh, right. You know, anything that has a hard date due this week, you're going to want to be prepared for that. Soft dates that you can move around, you're going to have a little bit more flexibility. And no dates, you can, you know, you can start filling those uh, in in the gaps. But you really have to, you have to stop and step back. I mean, this, again, is the delusion of no time to plan. At some point, you have to take a, a little chunk of time every day. Maybe it's 10 minutes at the end of every day and really, you know, look. Map it out. Without doing any work. Right. At, at what you have ahead of you. Um, and, and so that's, that's it. A little bit longer answer, but, uh, it, it is a really difficult challenge. And I hope and some a common of that one. helps. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Good. All Thank right. you. What's next? Should we go to information clutter? Oh, gosh, this is another one that hit me right between the eyes. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw this and I'm like, oh, Pete, 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 Pete. Yeah. You this got is, this one. This is uh, from Katie, and she has uh, paper and information clutter. She says she's been journaling since she was 18. She's now 47. Uh, and she has been keeping these journals. She has them. She has uh, her lists and notebooks and folders and sticky notes and index cards and lots of information, thoughts and ideas, etc. Uh, she is an ever note user, uh, but that is also becoming uh, a, a tentacle, an uh, information tentacle, and she is not managing that well, she says. Um, but she does acknowledge that she has a special gift of writing, and, and that's how she retains and processes information. She says, I think I've realized the resulting clutter has become a growing monster that literally makes me feel heavy whenever I think of tackling it. This is Wow. <laughs> uh, man, uh, she, she goes on to say some, some other things that, but uh, you know, that, that really, um, uh, boils it down to this. I also believe I am probably emotionally t- attached to information like one can get attached to sentimental objects. I just wouldn't know where to begin or how to proceed with any sort of culling uh, so that she can get her head above water and swim with a purpose. Oh my gosh, do I ever resonate with this? 
Here's the thing. First, let go of one gigantic assumption that your project is to organize everything, right? That is not your project with information clutter like this. You have decades of information. And if you even, I totally get that heaviness, right? I get what Mm -hmm. that feels like in your stomach when you face this either a digital archive or shelves of notebooks, whatever. Uh, but, but we do have two things going on here, right? You, one, you're a digital pack rat. You've got a lot of information and that's, that's fine. I mean, we can, we can tackle that in some way, shape or form, but two, that you think you have to organize everything you've packed away. I would challenge you to think not about focusing on the body of information that you have, but on what you want to do with that information, right? Example, say you decide you want to write a book on X then your project is X, not your information. Your project is filtering for X, leaving the rest of all of your your stuff untouched, right? Then mm-hmm. write the book. Write the book about that thing. You can keep all you want uh, for I may need it someday. That's kind of the process of journaling. But at some point, when you decide you want to do something, then your job is to filter through the stuff and not get attached to organizing it all. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, definitely. That's great. That, I think that swim with a purpose great is advice. perfect. And I love yeah. that, that she answered her own question. You find your purpose and then start swimming through your information with that goal in mind. That mm-hmm. is your central objective. Everything else uh, can can be saved for your next purpose. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's years down the road, but there's nothing wrong with a great journaling, great processing um, methodology. And I, I love that you're doing it. That's great. Yay! I knew you'd have an answer to that. Yeah, that's a that's a hard one uh, answer. I feel like I've I've definitely been in that uh, in that particular boat. I know what that. I'm in it every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I I like how the, the approach of it as swimming with the purpose, like what you're saying, is that just focus on whatever the purpose is, and then it kind of releases the pressure of feeling like you have to get rid of other material or you have to press delete when you don't want to, you know? So I like your approach. I think it's great. Excellent. All right. So the last kind of section or chapter here is about school, school related stuff. Oh, good. And, uh, I have a feeling that we're both probably going to answer these questions. Yeah. Um, and okay. So the first one from Deb is she has some backstory. Um, and she is actually talking about a high school student, Um, and there was some fear of not passing his current grade. And so her question, um, is, do you have any suggestions, thoughts as how I might help my son remember his homework and get it completed and submitted on time without constantly organizing things on his behalf? Okay. Well, and and I actually split the question up into three, um, you know, remembering his homework, completing his homework and turning it in. Cause those are really three different steps. Mm -hmm. Um, and as far as remembering his homework, you know, I, I think it's working with him and figuring out how he is going to record his assignments at the time that they're given, um, and what he needs to do to make sure that he documents that. We don't want to wait until the end of the day. You don't want to wait until you see him and say, okay, what homework do you have? And he has to try to figure that out. So, um, you know, many students have planners. And so I think that this might be the time that you are talking to him about how he's using it. Maybe it's highlighting, you know, using a certain color to attract his attention on just homework. Um, the other idea is to maybe even have a, a completely separate sheet that's just for homework that maybe he's like in the front of his binder. Um, so each period that he's in class at the end, when he's, you know, when they give out an assignment, he goes to just this one sheet and puts down, you know, what the assignment is and what he needs. Like if he needs a book or something special. Um, and this is something that, that you could actually kind of do like a generic worksheet and just make copies of it. So you have a new sheet every day, you know, that you're yeah. writing in and out and just right. have it in front of your notebook. You know, b- before leaving for the day, having some kind of anchor or some kind of reminder for him to just check for homework. Uh, and that could be maybe something that, and I think I mentioned this, I did this for my daughter, you know, something on his backpack just to remind him, did you get everything for homework? It could also be a note, you know, a sticky note inside of his locker, something to trigger his memory just to make sure that he has everything he needs. Now, the completing the homework, um, I think that there probably does have to be some accountability, you know, either to the parent, um, 
some, somehow there needs to be some communication, you know, okay, what homework do you have today? And let me know when you're done. You know, you have to kind of, and it's not, it's hard because I know in high school you want them to take responsibility, but at the same time, if they have ADHD, I, I just don't see any way to not be involved in this process because you're really teaching them the skills that they need to do when they go to college. And in college, they don't have you. And that's a much harder transition. Um, so I think any kind of habits and things that you can build here in high school are going to be really important. It's interesting. It's interesting you bring that up too, because we, I just went to not a lot. Well, it was, it was probably a couple months ago. I went to the uh, orientation for first time high school student parents, Mm -hmm. uh, at my daughter's new high school where she will be attending next year. And that was their guidance for everybody, right? The, the principal stood up and said, listen, You've been super involved as a parent in your middle school. Your job is not finished yet. You are every day need to be involved to help them continue to cement good habits about getting their work done, making sure they turn it in on time. This is something they are not finished developing. Just because it says high school student, they are not finished. Please do not let go of them conditioning these behaviors. And that's for everybody, not just ADHD. And I'm I was, so glad to oh hear that. Oh my goodness. It was so gratifying. It was just heartwarming. So I'm, I really think that all of these things that you're describing is really, that's just great. I, I would just have one thing that if I would ask you to reflect on too, that we've been trying to do around here, um, which is that, that our job is not to, uh, it, our job is to create space and time for kids to organize, not space and time to organize our kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, what and, and actually the last little note that I wrote here is that you don't need to organize for him, but you need to be there to help him and to teach him the skills that he needs to to have so that this doesn't continue to be an issue. Because yeah. I coach students with ADHD that are in college mm-hmm. and it it is a different ball game. Well, and certainly by the with, time you yeah, get to college, yeah. Yeah. And so I just think You've got, you, yeah, you've got to be involved. You don't have to do it for them, but you got to, you got to guide them and you have to lead them and you have to keep them accountable for it. That means us being involved. Absolutely. We did, uh, you know, we're, we're also practicing modeling behavior too. You know, both my wife and I use some, some semblance of digital versus paper versus notebook planner. And so doing daily organizing or organizer daily checks, uh, for each of us, like around the dinner table saying, you know, what are we working on? What are the things we're most proud of? Oh. What do we have going on today while we're sitting Pete. at dinner captive, uh, has been really helpful. We have, uh, our family Great calendar idea. is a whiteboard on the wall and it has, mm-hmm. you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. All of the things that we're doing and we're, we're sitting down and talking about, you know, our, our schedule. And that is kind of modeling behavior as well. Like, what are the things that you have do today? When are they do? We help them break up the projects. We don't help them do the work. We just make sure that we're talking about it every single day. And I love that you're mentioning that because that was in my notes. You oh, see? Yeah. <laughs> now you're doing it. You're saying you're doing it on a daily basis. I love that. Yeah. And I would, I would do it on a daily basis, but at the very, very least, make sure you're doing it on a weekly basis, either at the beginning of the week or at the end of the week, asking him, you know, what are the assignments that are due? Check. I mean, I know that in in our school system, we can check their grades. We know what missing assignments they have, and I can write them down and say to my son, okay, this is what's missing. And our, our kind of rule of thumb is until you get those things in, you're not doing anything this weekend. Mm -hmm. So you have till Friday to make sure that all of these things are, are completed. So I think that like just adding on to what you're saying, having that kind of weekly meeting of what's going on? What's missing? What do you need to make sure that you get this done? Um, and, and just kind of helping them fill in the pieces. I, I think one of the challenges that I think I, I cannot relate to is that I, I know that there is a, a an internal kind of emotional struggle for independence when you get these kids that are a little bit older in high school, right? They, they're, they don't want to talk about that stuff. They, they haven't like what everything I'm doing with my younger kids is to try to condition them so that they won't get, you know, so that they'll do this on their own, right? <laughs> By the time right. they get to the point where they don't want to talk to me, uh, they'll do it on their own. And so I, I don't have necessarily an answer for, you know, you, if you're dealing with um, a kid who who needs who needs this kind of support but absolutely doesn't want to do it yeah that's that's tough and yeah. you know it almost goes back to the 
you know, I don't want to do my chores, yeah, <laughs> right? right? Like the, right. the family, I don't want to organize with you. Um, when, when, when you're crossing into the, just the defiance piece of it, um, then you're, again, I think you're going into a, a, a different issue that probably needs to be addressed in a different way, which is probably getting some therapy yeah. or some kind of professional help to come in and, and, um, help everybody in the family kind of manage that. Yeah. Um, which is why it's why I bring it up. And I, yeah. you know, I feel like there is, there is a, uh, uh, circumstance that I know that I, I'm because I don't have any high school kids in my house. No, yet, right, you know, right. I, I just don't know uh, what that what that's uh, going to look like. Well, and just one final piece about this particular question is the turning in piece. That is a step of the process that many many um, children or teenagers do forget because. They've done the work. And so in their mind, they're done. <laughs> and so, yeah, right. and, and that happens, you know, even in the workplace, it's like, well, I finished the report. I just forgot to send it in the email. Um, you know, because it, it, it feels like it's done. So I think that that is also another kind of, um, part of the system that you got to have to work together on solutions is how do you make sure that you turn it in? You know, what reminder do you need to, to have? Because the teachers aren't necessarily going to say, you know, especially in high school, you need to turn in your paper. Right. Um, some do, but not always. And so, um, again, working on that solution and really taking that piece of it as a separate piece too. Like this is a step that has to be done. How do we make sure that, that it happens? Right. Um, okay. So another question about, um, students, which is kind of very similar to what we've already been talking about. Any ideas on helping teach a preteen fundamentals? of organizing her things in a matter that makes sense to her, um, as well as managing time. And I broke this up a little bit too, into two things, organizing her things and managing her time. Um, and I'm just going to kind of guess that maybe what she's talking about with organizing her things is kind of in space in general. So like her bedroom. Um, and I really think that you got to have to, you have to start with the conversation with her about what she would like for her space. Um, and really get like, listen to her, like really listen to what her challenges are, listen to what she wants, um, what would make sense to her. And if you start to organize her room with her, you know, start with sorting and purging and get that stuff out that she doesn't, you know, want anymore, because we don't want to spend our time organizing or putting things in place that we don't care about, right? That just, we want to get the, the old stuff out immediately. Um, and then I would say with teenagers, especially, you know, what are her favorite things? What are her everyday items? What are the things that she, that, that are most important to her and make sure that those items, um, have the open and visual home so that she knows exactly where to go to get them. Don't expect that the room is going to be clean and in order all the time because it's not going to be. I right? love We're not... that she wrote not to me at all in her question. Like, yeah, it doesn't it make d- sense to me. And it shouldn't. It doesn't necessarily have to. So you can let that go. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to. And it's not always going to be clean. And so I think it's just, you know, coming up with solutions together of what makes sense to her and what's the maintenance going to look like. So maybe it's not daily clean up, you know, but maybe it's just every few days you ask her to, to pick up her space. Um, and, and so there's just some general things there. I, I don't know if I'm answering. It's a very broad question, so it's kind of hard to answer uh, specifically, yeah. right? And the managing time question is really, that's a very general statement. Um, how do I help somebody manage their time? And I would have to ask, you know, you have to zero in on where she's having trouble managing her time. Um, you know, are things taking longer than what she's expecting? Is she running late? You know, really pick apart where is the issue with the time um, and tackle only one issue at a time. <laughs> because if you try to tackle everything, it's going to be very confusing. I think, you know what this gets back to? It, you remember the dots, uh, the dots for time estimating that we talked yeah. about? It was a long time ago. I'm not even sure if it was, it was kind of before we pivoted. Um, it, it was this, the, the whole idea where you, you know, a time, a, a completed circle next to an item on a task list is like one hour and then a circle and a half circle is an hour and a half, right? For me, managing time starts with estimating time, right? So right. once kids get really good at figuring out how long it takes to do something, and this will take forever because it, it takes a long time to in, internalize the amount of time it takes to do a particular activity. But once they get good at that, they then they automatically sort of 
start to get good at at filling in those holes on uh, on their schedule of actually managing their own time. It, it's, Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's, it starts with estimating. I think, yeah, definitely. I think it starts with estimating. And then just to kind of give a quick example, just so that I can take the, the general part of the question out and give you something more specific. Um, if she's late for school, for example, then I think like you're saying, Pete, do an evaluation of what's happening. How long is it really taking her to do things um, in the morning? Map out what exactly it is that she has to do in the morning. Uh, what does she need to have to, to make those things happen? What's kind of the time frame that she needs to have? Uh, maybe for her, following some kind of checklist might help. Um, it may require her getting up earlier. And it also may require some elimination of distractions. I had a client recently uh, when we were talking about morning routine that one of the rabbit holes that she'd get stuck in is she would she would look at her phone um, or she would actually start reading the news like on her phone in her apartment. And it's like, oh, no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> because that's going to take longer than what you expect. And so let's not check the news until after you're done getting ready. I mean, it's those kinds of things that you kind of want to dig a little deeper and kind of really figure out where, um, you're, you know, what, what's, what is hap- what, where are you getting distracted basically? Right. And, um, trying to figure out what you need to do to, to make those mornings smoother. So that's just kind of giving you an example, um, of what to do. And on a side note, uh, if you have a child with ADHD and they do not already have an IEP plan in place, I do highly, highly recommend doing so and working with the schools to make that happen. Even if you don't think that they need accommodations right now, that can change in a heartbeat and you want to have the plan in place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, definitely recommend you doing that. I personally do not um, coach in that, in that age range. Um, I coach for adults and college students, but I do have an excellent, um, website for people to look into if they're looking for coaching for their children. And that is called impact ADHD.com. It's just Im- impact M- impact. I- M- P- a- yep. A ADHD.com. We'll have right. that in the show notes yep. and um, excellent resource to look into. They do coaching and they have blogs and I've listened to some of their seminars and just really great. So excellent. Look into that. That's what we have, Pete. I love it. What a great thing. Under 45 minutes. We did this. We did it. Well done. This was Thank so you. much fun. I love these questions. I love talking about these questions. I love learning from these questions. This has been great. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for um, submitting your questions. And if you still have more, feel free to bring them to our attention and we will answer them. That's right. I don't want to make any commitments, but we're going to do this again. We will. That's the commitment. At some yes. point in, in a future, <laughs> we will do the uh, Q&A episode again. This has been a real treat. So thanks, everybody, yeah. for writing in. Uh, I think that's it. Um, uh, we don't have any other news right now. We're nope. just going to wrap it up, right? Sounds good. Consider it wrapped. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. And we will catch you next week right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. 